All right, these are your EOC Ecology Review notes. As I said with the cell review, this isn't meant for you to go through and take notes. This is meant for you to just kind of listen and watch as a review, and you might need to pause at certain points to review what's on the screen. So we'll start with abiotic and biotic factors. So abiotic and biotic. Abiotic, you should know, is non-living, and biotic is living. So examples of abiotic factors can be found here, so things like water, light, wind, soil, etc. Biotic are mainly relationships, so it's other organisms and how they interact, so competition, predation, symbiosis, and then disease. These are the levels of organization you should know, and this is the smallest to the largest. Okay, an organism, easy enough, you know that that's just one single thing. A population is a group of organisms. A community is multiple populations. And this could be plants and animals. Ecosystem is living and non-living. Biome is, an e is ecosystems with similar climates. And then biosphere is essentially the earth. So habitat versus niche. So a niche is kind of the role of an organism in that habitat. Whereas the habitat is just where it actually lives. And then the environment is everything else. So the environment has the non-living too. So predation versus parasitism. Predation is one eats another. So you have happy and dead. Parasitism is one feeds on another, but it doesn't kill it because if it kills it, it loses its food source. So it doesn't want to kill it. So this is like fleas on a dog. So you have one that's happy, the flea, one that's sad, the dog. So other symbi symbiotic relationships, a symbiotic relationship is in general is just two organisms that interact. Mutualism then is they're both happy. They're both mutually happy. Commensalism is one's happy, one's just kind of on the fence. The other one, parasitism, is one is happy, one is sad. So we said this is like a flea and a dog. Mutualism is, we'll say Nemo, sort of writing clownfish, and sea and enemy. And then the commensalism is the shark with that fish that swims below it to get food scraps. So energy flow in an ecosystem or any type of environment, you have your top carnivore, and then at the bottom you have your producers. If you don't have a producer, you don't have a food pyramid. And notice how the energy changes as we go up. It decreases by a power of 10. So we can say that as we move up, we lose energy. So cycling of matter. We have a fixed amount of matter. So what supports the ecosystem function? This constant cycling. So we have four major cycles. So water, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So first the water cycle, and this is where you might want to start pausing and reviewing. So water cycle, I would just pause this and look this over. This is the most basic one you need to know. Um, the arrows kind of show you how everything goes. Next up is the carbon cycle. So there's two major processes in the carbon cycle. You have photosynthesis and respiration. Remember that photosynthesis releases oxygen 
and it takes in CO2. While respiration releases CO2 and it takes in oxygen. So plants do photosynthesis, animals, humans, we do respiration. It's important to remember as well that things like factories and fossil fuels are releasing CO2. Fire from deforestation also releasing CO2. And then you have your fossil fuels and other things decomposing going into the ground in the form of carbon. The nitrogen cycle is kind of similar to the carbon cycle because it does take place above and below ground. So we have the lightning, which as a result turns nitrogen into a usable form for plants. Okay, so we have the lightning makes the nitrogen go underground. Then you also have fertilizer adding on. All of it's going to the plants. Well, the cow is eating the plants, so consuming that nitrogen but then through cow waste or when the cow dies, you have nitrogen back in the soil. Then you have bacteria in the soil that breaks down the soil nitrogen and returns it to the atmosphere as a gas. And then that in turn goes back to your clouds which would get re-released to the ground via lightning. The phosphorus cycle once again, you probably want to pause here and look this over. So we have farming causes runoff of phosphates. You also have rivers that carry the phosphates to the soil or the water. Then we have plants absorbing. So all the phosphorus is in here. Plants are absorbing it. And then once again, animals eat the plants. And then when animals die or their waste goes back into the ground. So types of succession. So you have primary and secondary. So primary is bare rock, while secondary was once an environment. So primary starts from rock, then you have your pioneer species, all the way until you get to your full community of your largest trees. Whereas the secondary succession could have started as this full community, then it burned or a tornado or a flood, something happened, so you're left with just the soil. From there, all your species begin to repopulate until you're back to what you originally had. So biomes, so they are classified three ways, very important to know this, so temperature, climate, and rainfall. And these are some of the major biomes you should know, so tundra, temperate forest, desert, saltwater, and tropical rainforest. It would be worth looking up just general facts about these. So limiting factors is something that causes a population to decrease in size or change in size. So there's going to be density dependent and density independent. Dependent means it depends on something. So things that are living are usually density dependent, things like disease or overpopulation. Density independent means it doesn't matter how many that are living there, you're going to have an issue. So flood, tornado, fire, any of those are density independent. So whether there's five rabbits in the forest or 50, they're all going to be affected. So R strategist versus K strategist. So a lot of you struggled with this on the packet. A K strategist produces only few offspring and they like stable environments. An example of a K strategist would be an elephant. Humans are also K strategists. R strategists have many offspring. and they do well in unstable environments. So these are things like bacteria, mice, things that produce lots of babies a year. Okay, the next thing is growth. So exponential versus logistics. So exponential basically just hasn't reached a carrying capacity yet. It's still going. Ex or that's exponential. Logistic is when you go here, but you've kind of reached that carrying capacity where your line levels out. So a little bit more on that. So if you look here, 
80 is probably right around the carrying capacity of this deer population because we went above it and kind of below it, then it's just kind of staying right around 80. Same thing here if you look here. The blue line is the carrying capacity, and then the red line is the population. So you're going to go a little over, a little below. And carrying capacity is just the maximum number of individuals an environment can support. So human population, there's some questions with this. Just in general, will the human population grow forever? It's kind of an opinion. Some scientists say yes, some say no. What type of growth, exponential versus logistic? Well, if we go back, we haven't reached that carrying capacity yet, so we are still at exponential. And reasons for growth? We have better health care. Sewer. Better ways of living and not getting sick, such as vaccines. So the problems with overpopulation is food becomes an issue and clean water. And that's all.